Jeannie Robertson. Oh, she's a heck of a lot of fun, Jeannie Robertson. Okay, this is Jeannie Robertson, and I'm back on my back porch after being in Las Vegas last Saturday for sort of a surprise live from the back porch, only from the room that we were staying in, and I could look out and see the pool. Um, I have such such excitement over our guest today. It's Mark Sharonbrock, and he is from Minnesota. Is that correct, Mark? I think so. Minnesota, and he lives, uh, since the pandemic started, he has lived on a lake. They have a lot of lakes up there. We've heard all about it. It's amazing. He's a member of the National Speakers Association. And as I told y'all all week, I say he is the best keynote speaker, motivational speaker in the business. I'm just proud to call him a friend we met years ago. What we're going to do, first of all, is since he's not here, he's going to be on the big screen, we're going to give away three guests, so uh, gifts, and so here it goes. These are the people in here that will win, and these are the people that just entered during the much of July. Chris Morrison. Is that Chris Morrison from Graham, North Carolina, my hometown? And then he says... Do you know Charles Barkley? So I'll ask him that right away. Second prize, pick up one right here. This will be the next winner. Okay. Theresa Lamb. Okay. Uh, Theresa asked a question earlier about my speech last week at the National Speakers Association. The truth is, we all take it up a notch when we're speaking to speakers. So if people think I did well, I'm quite excited. That is two of them, right, Tony? Yeah, Teresa's a speaker. Teresa's a speaker? I believe so. So we've got two winners, one from Graham, North Carolina, and one a speaker. Okay, we better have somebody here that's not involved or people will say, uh-uh. Okay, Leslie Lazaro, Lazaro Restemeyer. L-A-Z-Z-A-R-O, and Westermeyer is W-E-S-T-M-E-I-R. And she says, we're excited you're coming to Tulsa. I'll be there. Don't I have two shows in Tulsa, Tony? No. Why? No, you have two shows in Oklahoma City. Very similar. Oklahoma City, Same Tulsa. State, but... Same state. I'm sorry. So there's our first three winners. And you can have your choice. Of everything that I have, all of my junk, stuff, swag, whatever you call it, except you cannot have the audio books at seven hours. That's our big prize later. But books that I've written, uh, just D- DVDs, CDs, left brain hat, whatever you want, you write Tony at JeannieRobertson.com and tell her what you want, and she'll get it for you. And now I want to introduce this great motivational speaker and friend that I've been telling you about, and that is Mark Sharonbrock. There he is. Hey, Mark. Hey. How are you? (laughs) You're out on your lake. You you have a place in Minneapolis, but now where did you go when the pandemic started? Well, welcome to Minnesota. I like your Minnesota. There's nothing better than a southerner trying to say, yeah, Minnesota. Minnesota. (laughs) Don't you just make the O long? Yeah, I don't know. Minnesota. Oh, crepes, Minnesota. You're on your okay. back porch. We're on our on our back deck here on the lake in Minnesota, up in north. Oh, I see the water behind you. So yeah. how far does that water go? How much do you own of the water? All the way to the shore. <laughs> All the way to the shore. <laughs> we own just enough to enjoy ourselves up here. It's and you know, a lot of people know uh, we have a Minnesota uh, viewers today, which is great. There's 10,000 lakes. Thankfully, none of them frozen right now. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. The, 10, 000, is the land of 10,000 lakes, are it they is. exaggerating? No, actually, there's more. That's not even counting mm-hmm. the ponds. Okay. <laughs> and you leave that gorgeous place and go out and motivate people? That's what I hope to do. I don't like to leave. <laughs> but, uh, I, that's what I, but I, I, I love to, like you, Jeannie, 
uh, I love to go out and be with an audience and change some minds and hearts. We've got some great questions for you. And the first one, I we don't have the person's name, but one lady wrote in and said, how long did it take you in the first grade to, to spell your last name? Learn to spell it. Third year of college. <laughs> Good for you. So I have posted some clips. I posted the clip about um, it's a box. It's a box. I love that. I mean, I'm just, I just love it. And I know some of the people in the audience. And of course, I also posted the, um, um, which ones did I post, y'all? Nice bike. No, about nice bike. I want you to explain to people what nice bike is. Oh, and he's got a cup. He's got a, hey, nice bike. I like it. I know. There it is. Oh, and the kids in the car. They want to know about the kids in the car. And, And I have to tell you how many people wrote and said, I heard him when I was in high school and he changed my life. What a compliment. That's that's as sweet as it gets. Well, it does. It does. So tell they us. didn't say for the better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. There's a voice that just came in. I don't know who that is, uh, but uh, somebody's broken into oh, our. That's Patrick oh, that's Patrick Henry. He's here every week, and way back on the back is Tony Meredith, who's hey, run Tony. my office for 43 years. So Sue, your wife, runs your office. She does. I report directly to Sue. She runs everything we do. <laughs> okay. And she well, and she's amazing. Catch us up because um, I want to know how many children you have and what they think of the of the whole story about driving the kids in the car and now grandchildren. Do you have those two hanging around? You were blessed with three of them. You bet. Ellen, James, what? Fritz, and Una. What? Her last uh, Evelyn, James, Fritz. And Una, U N A. Oh, I love that. It sounds like the Von Trapp children. No. <laughs> Why not? So, what do no. they? What do they? People ask me often, "What does Beaver think about your stories?" And of course, if Beaver will give me a good story, I'm very grateful. And uh, what do they? What do they think about you, especially when you talk about them? They know that it helped pay for their college tuition, so they're, okay. they're just, they were just fine with it. Uh, okay. Like like you, Jeannie, uh, all my stories come from my experiences. It's not a Google search. It's you know, because it's yeah. amazing what happens to us happens to a lot of people. And what you're referring to the the hobby parent, you know, we made a lot of drives from Minneapolis up to the Whitefish Chain here in Cross Lake. That's the lake we're on. And being in a car with one child, two children, three children, it's a completely different experience. <laughs> yes, I think you. Pegged it quite well, if you want to know the truth. All right, we got questions here. I have my own that I will. Oh, and Patrick mentioned something right before you we started about your children raising the flag on the 4th of July at the, at the water there. And right before you came on, you said, we do this every year? For the grandkids, we have, well, okay, so Susie's grandparent name is nana and i wanted to be oompa but my granddaughter after a little while changes to apu so okay. it's nana and apu apu so i'm apu okay. uh, now my great my grandson changes just to poo so i'm <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it's a good move to tell you the truth but we have camp for the kids here at the cabin and so we do all kind of merit badges and contests and a flag raising in the morning and james blows the bugle and uh yeah, it's kind of cool. We love it. I think it's real cool. I really do. It's about traditions. I mean, th- some of the best moments of life are those traditions that you relive. And I think the, the more traditions you can create in a family or with a community, the better. I, lo- I love traditions. Well, and it comes out through your speaking, too. What got me was that you started in college in a comedy troupe. And I know, I know your age and my age. And just to jump into a comedy troupe at that age is amazing. And y'all had a bus that you painted and drove around? We did. We, I was <laughs> uh, uh, in speech in high school. and um, But another guy and I loved it. When they had talent shows, right, in the high school, 
Uh, we did short sketch comedy. We did Abbott and Costello's Who's On First. You remember that oh, piece? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We that piece and we did what? that. What's who's, on second? Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. No. <laughs> That's a classic piece of material. It is. It's the greatest. And so we memorized that, did it for the talent show. And anytime, as you know, Jeannie, you can get an audience to laugh. I mean, it's 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 magical. It's fun. And so we said, hey, let's let's create a group and do some comedy. And so we did a show for our high school and we packed the theater. It turned out. And so we uh, formed a group, bought a bus, started doing shows in high schools all over. And uh, it was called Mom's Apple Pie. It was just fun, clean humor. And we performed mainly in high schools. And That's then, amazing. Yeah. And then the group broke up because of my wife, Yoko Ono. And so it's really <laughs> Why? Why? Wait a minute. I broke up. He what? said his wife is like Yoko Ono and broke up the comedy okay. tree. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so you... But you just took off and you were in high school and you're going around in this bus and y'all are doing skits. We are. Yeah, we did shows. I and can then, assure uh, you if if Susie didn't break up the group, you wouldn't be sitting on that beautiful lake house property. No. no, no. <laughs> You'd still be in the bus. I think you need to get a real job. And so, uh, but um, I started speaking high schools on my own as a solo at all those high schools we did shows at. And that's what kind of the career took off. So, so I've been, I spoke at about 3,500 high schools and gyms, not like fellowship of Christian athletes, but like real kids in a gym. It's, it, yeah. it's different. Yeah. Okay. So what did the group think when you took off and started doing these solo? Were you breaking up anyway and going to college or what? No, they, I mean, everybody was good with it. It was time. Uh, they all kind of went their own ways. And, uh, but I, I stayed in the entertainment Avenue and uh, stayed there ever since. Oh, my God. Then when you got out of high school and went to college, you kept doing it. You just kept doing shows. I mean, this is amazing to me. I know how I got in it. Somebody set my speeches up for me with the pageant. But this is just fascinating. Word of mouth, people would call you and say, come, or did y'all call and get them? You know, actually, I worked for a, a company for a while called Jostens. They make class rings in your books. Amazing company. And they hired me as a speaker to go out in schools and talk about being involved. I mean, a, a student, if a student's highly involved in high school, they're more interested in getting a yearbook or purchasing a class ring. And so I didn't talk about the products, but just how important involvement was in school. Take some risks, make some good choices. And they said, wow, there's a lot of demand for you, not enough you. I said, well, how about if we just make a movie of my speech? So they made a 16 millimeter movie. It was called The Greatest Days of Your Life So Far. Because maybe high school is not the best time for everybody, but as long as you're there, be a part of it. Well, the film was shown in 10,000 high schools throughout the 80s every year. And that pretty well created the market. And that's where a lot of people heard me. 10,000 wow. high schools. Every year. I've seen the movie. I watched the movie this week. And it just, I'm sad that a lot of kids in this last year have not experienced the best years of your life yet. Right. Uh, because they haven't had the opportunity. I agree. Yeah. It's been a tough year for kids. Yeah. Well, my daughter got to skip seventh grade live, and I think that's a great thing. Okay. Seventh grade was horrible for me. You didn't. You didn't like high school. Seventh grade. Seventh grade. Yeah, Meredith. Meredith was doing homeschool, not homeschooling, but virtual, virtual school. And so she got to miss all of the insecurity and bullying and everything that goes along with seventh grade and go straight to eighth grade. Well, you know, I was six feet, two inches tall at age 13 in the seventh grade. I don't remember any bullying. They were afraid of me. They were afraid of me. I but everything was but everything was black and white back then. And apple pies waiting on you when you got home, wasn't it a different time? We could find the peanut butter. We were in good shape. <laughs> No, I just, I just was told to roll with the punches. I remember mother one day, um, I came home and I said, some people are making fun of me about being tall. And she hugged me. She said, honey, I'm so sorry. Set the table. I mean, she just <laughs> wouldn't hear it. You know, that was it. And I got up and I set the table. I, said, I was getting no sympathy at that point. But, but that's not the way it is for a lot of kids. The seventh grade can be tough. But 10,000 
you showed it to 10,000 people. Then when you, did you cr creep along doing that? And I advise everybody to watch the best years of your life so far. It's on, it's on the thing. I found it under your name. Yeah, because it's on it just YouTube. made you feel so good, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it, high school can be a, a, a tough time for a lot of kids. Uh, but yeah. the best way to work your way through it is to be involved in something and, and find out what your gifts are. I mean, my biggest message to students at that time was to make sure they're sharing instead of comparing. Uh, do you remember in first grade when you brought your equipment for the very first time to school? I remember uh, mom sent me to school with a, a box of five crayons. I, I had a large Catholic family and I was number four out of five. And I, I always had the junk drawer crayons. Uh, <laughs> you know, they came out of the cigar box, were all gnarly and taken off. And I remember sitting in first grade and the teacher told us it was time to color. And I was so excited. And I pulled out my box of five crayons, never been used by another human being. Just come on, let's let's color. A little girl sitting next to me took out an attache case, uh, <laughs> 9,000 crayons, three decks went upwards, metallic colors, gold, silver, copper, electric sharpener in the back. She's way ahead of her time. <laughs> and I remember her looking at me saying, I have 17 different shades of orange. And I'm thinking, I don't even have orange. <laughs> and what happens to a lot of us is instead of being excited about somebody else, oh, you have copper, can I try it? People start to compare. Instead of sharing the joy of somebody else, you start to compare. Uh, you know, boy, if I had that many crayons, I could really color something special. Boy, if I had that boat, I could, boy, if I had that car, if I had that job, if I had that title, boy, if I was only, and it gets to the point where you, you can never have enough crayons. I mean, because Bill Gates will always have more, right? <laughs> so the, the moral of the story is, Share your talents, don't compare them. Stop counting crayons, just draw pictures. That's great. And that's what you were telling high school students. That was it. And I, I and think then did it, at themselves. some point, did, oh, excuse me, what, what were you saying? I, I, you know, the freedom to be yourself, and that's okay. I think that's what the key message was. Well, at, at, at the convention last week in Las Vegas, that's one theme that we heard from the stage was, a life of compare is a life of despair, which is interesting. That wasn't one of my points. No. No. <laughs> I was waiting on you to mention the, my speaker. There were more than one not. speaker there, but we only listened to you. Okay. Then I'm going to get to these questions. And by the way, Jeannie, you, Jeannie, you were so kind to me. The people out there have to know, I mean, you, you've been my hero in speaking from day one. I mean, I still remember the very first time I met you at NSA because it, it, people out there have to know. I mean, it's like there's 2,000 speakers and there's one genie and she's like the Pope, <laughs> only, only, only taller. <laughs> you Now we know why you're such a good, smooth speaker. No, I you, remember the first time we met, I met you and Sue, and somehow you learned that I love the Andy Griffith Show. And yeah. then you came up to me and said, on our honeymoon, maybe, you met Don Knotts, or he slid a piece of paper under your door. What? Do you even remember that? You told me, and I thought, I have met somebody who met Don Knotts. <laughs> I was thrilled. Do you even remember that? No, I do. I mean, I was 23, Susie was 20, and we got married. And on our in Minneapolis, on our wedding night, we stayed at the Hotel Sofitel. Pretty fancy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're, we uh, first time I'd ever been on an airplane was on our honeymoon. We flew out to Nova Scotia and we went to the hotel. Instead of bringing one night bag, we had four suitcases because we had never traveled before. So we had a bellman. And the way to our room, he said, by the way, which he shouldn't have said, the room next to you, um, Mr. Don Knotts is staying in. I said, really? And so Susie's unpacking, kind of getting ready for the night. It's our honeymoon. And I'm sitting at the desk writing a note. Dear Mr. Knotts, I'm a huge fan <laughs> of the show, yada, yada. And I went over and slipped, and she said, "Are you, hello, I'm here. Anyway, I'll be right back. <laughs> so I slipped the note under his door that night. You didn't. And sure, yes, the next did. morning, under our door, zoom, the note from Don Knotts. Congratulations, Mark and Susie. I'm so happy for you. And uh, 
Yeah, you had some That's nice, right. maybe have a great life together. So, yeah, so I made a copy of it and sent it off to you because I know what a huge fan you are. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I still have it. So, the, uh, so uh, I mean, I'm just the way that it went at a certain point, you said, maybe I don't need to be speaking to teenagers anymore. And you went, your next thing was nice bike. Right. Nice bike. You, you want to tell them a quick story about how that came about? I will. I, what happened was, you know, kids grow up, as some of your listeners have, and they turn from high school students and they got jobs and worked at businesses. And they'd sit around a table, you know, just like they do for you, and say, who, who should we bring in for a speaker? Anybody to hurt anybody? And they say, you know, I heard a guy back in high school. Let me Google him, see if he's still alive. And oh. we can bring him in. Still so alive. <laughs> And so they, that kind of made the transition from high schools into Marriott ballrooms. And my message, I knew how to stand up in front of an audience and entertain like you do, Jeannie, not as good as you, but I wasn't sure of the message. So I was speaking to a group of teachers north of Milwaukee, flew from Minneapolis to Milwaukee, landed, rented a car, beige Ford Taurus from Avis. I'm driving north and I realized I just landed in the Harley Davidson 100th year anniversary half a million bikers in the city and i've never been on a harley uh to this day i've never even sat on one i have a pontoon boat that's as exciting as i get <laughs> but but that day seeing all these harleys and all this chrome and all that black leather but i wanted a harley i mean, I mean i'm sitting in the <laughs> beige horse going i want a harley i don't even be part of this tribe and i'm like anybody like you are you're curious you always ask questions I pulled over to these different venues and I remember seeing this huge guy just looked like a Game of Thrones, big beard, tattoos, kind of an attitude, standing by his big black Harley. The guy walks by him, glances at him, goes, hey, nice bike. And this big Harley owner just starts smiling, telling the story about how he and his father, his father was a Vietnam vet and how he came together and they built this Harley. I mean, it wasn't about the Harley, it was about the connection. It was about the, hey, nice bike. It's about how we connect with each other. And that's what nice bike is all about. How to how to acknowledge people and to honor them and connect with them in a personal way. And it's a book full of stories that illustrate that. I mean, I get chill bumps when I hear you tell these stories sometimes. It's just mm. fascinating. All right, I'm going to ask you some questions. We'll see if you do as well as questions with questions. <laughs> so, all right, now I'll tell you the name. And this one is from Mary Wood. All right. I can't wait to see you all from Mary from Lake City, Florida. When will you be back in Florida? I love your back plate. So where's your question, Mary? Where's your question? <laughs> your back porch Saturdays, I've been watching you. You remind me of my husband of 44 years before he passed. Thank you, Mary. I didn't get the question. That wasn't a question. What was the question? No, no, so, just, Mary, I know you. You've her. written before. Let's just quickly go. I think uh, that was to you, and she asked, when will you be back in Florida? That was her when question. When will I be back in Florida? Uh, in September, in Orlando, September okay. 11th. But and then move the on villages. to find a question. No, no, that, that's till November. Villages is in November. See, I told you, this is not a perfect show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but thanks, Mary. Okay. Linda Malone Greenwall. Keep laughing, Jeannie. Maybe you should have previewed <laughs> some of these are pieces you, of paper. Are you <laughs> these get in the wrong, wrong bucket. What in the world? These were great. I just bragged and said these are the best questions. Okay. Oh, Michael Moody from Piedmont, Texas. So small, we don't have a sign anymore. If you had a story to tell on Jeannie, what would it be? My story on Jeannie? Well, you just uh, probably told it with Don Knotts. Yeah. Or uh, the thing that I love about Jeannie, many things, but is how creative Jeannie is. It takes me a long time to write a story, a long time to write material. And every time Jeannie's at the National Speakers, how many times you been on the main stage more than anybody else doing a keynote presentation haven't you Jeannie? Well, six, six or seven I, I, seven times i think it might be seven keynotes yeah well but who's counting that's more than anybody else and but all if we are, write new material 
we can get invited back. If we're telling the same material all the time, you can't get invited back. But I, my favorite story about Jeannie is, is when she, uh, how she gets material. Tell them about when you, the taxi driver, you, you. I do three questions. Um, and then we'll get back to how you do it. But, um, uh, I get in something like a cab, Uber, anything, even if it's, they've sent somebody to drive you. And I say, how long have you been, um, driving people back and forth? And they usually say, oh, 17 years, I've been driving forever. And I just let that sink in. And then I will say eventually, I bet you've seen a lot of funny things happen driving people around and say New Orleans or wherever. I've seen it, ma'am, you would not believe it. I could write a book. I could just write a book. And I'm thinking, come on, give me something, give me something. And then after a few minutes, I lean forward and say, what's the funniest thing you remember happening in a cab? And they tell me. And I, now what easier way you're passing time, you're getting material. You know, it can be the person saying it could have been that time I had a hog as a fair. I got out a pencil and started writing, you know, a hog. I said, a hog. You had a, like a big pig hog, H A W G. <laughs> so what do you do to find material? I talk to everybody. Hey, there's Randy Pennington. Hey, Randy. A while ago, I saw Neil Steele, my radio guy. Okay, what? how do you find an idea, and how long does it take you to really put that into a stage act and have the confidence to walk out there and try it? Well, when it comes to writing, um, one exercise I have is I have about four columns. The first column would be a, a person's name in my life. Second would be an experience I had with them. The third column is uh, uh, a lesson learned. And then the fourth column would be uh, application to the audience, relevancy. So, I mean, it, it might be my, my elementary football coach, Clarence White, or uh, my very first job at picking weeds for Mr. Juniman. At, uh, I mean, so anybody in my life and then those stories, and then I kind of uh, write them up and run them by Susie and see what she thinks, my wife. And by the way, those of you don't, that don't, haven't seen her, Susie is without question the most beautiful woman that that ever said hello back. Because I said hello <laughs> back. In there, she, she said hi back. And that was 43 years ago. We've been happily married. But anyway, that's so stories about Susie, stories about my kids, stories about my parents, Nubs and Aggie. And then um, you kind of try them out with an audience. And see if they like them. And and you know, Jeannie, when when people either laugh or nod their heads or write a note, you might have something there. And then you just keep developing it till it gets a little bit better. It grows. So, Mark, just grows. Um, I know a big part of what you do that's so unique and entertaining is is you bring in characters into your presentation. <laughs> um, you got any special guests there on the porch with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple. I mean, and it's all things that have happened. I, mean, uh, I remember. I'm driving from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma to Fort Smith, Arkansas, late at night to get to a presentation in the morning. And there's a toll booth around Tulsa, <laughs> the only toll booth. And uh, there's an older Southern gentleman working the booth. And I, I adore older Southern gentlemen because they always start every sentence with, I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> and then wisdom follows. So I, I pulled up late at night in this toll booth worker. And I kind of asked him fast Minnesota talk. Excuse me, sir. How long did it take to get from here to Fort Smith, Arkansas? <coughs> well, I tell you what, it's 91 miles, Fort Smith, Arkansas. It's up to you how long it's going to take. <laughs> <laughs> and, you have us pegged in the South. Yeah, and, and, and for 91 miles, that old Juan Kenobi voice kept coming back to me. I mean, it was, this is the way life is, kid. How do you want to approach it? This is the way the road can be. How do you want to make that journey? And I thought that was a nugget uh, of great wisdom. So I, I, I love that guy, the toll booth guy. And uh, you, you're you familiar with a coach? You, you had a coach? Oh, coach. You want to meet Coach? Coach well, takes yeah, props. Yeah, I'd love to meet the coach. Coach, coach takes props. I had to do a, a talk for a a sports group one time 
And I thought, what better way than to bring out coach, which is real simple. Just... Hey, good morning. My name's Coach Wally Bowers. I'm the assistant <laughs> offensive line coach for the Bemidji State Beavers at Bemidji State University up in northern Minnesota. I kind of know something about winning. And here's the deal. Listen up. Take a knee. Hey, there's no I in the word team. There's a T, couple E's, M. No I. Well, let's get after it. <laughs> uh, Patrick Henry, Patrick Henry, step up your game. You know what you need, Henry? You need focus. Focus. F-O-C-U-S. Focus. Here's an acronym. Now, Henry, what that means is this little word, you put little words after it. Acronym. F, find it. <laughs> oh, oh, I can see it. You, can you see it? See. See it to believe it. <laughs> yes, see it every day. Pretty much, I think that's how you spell focus. Got to be focused. I love it. I love it. Coach Bowers. <laughs> I love it. You've heard, you've met that man. You've heard that man. I mean, I was played sports too, and I had male coaches. They would tell you, the, I mean, hey, over here. That's hilarious. That's all right. Here's one. Let's see. Okay. From John Burgess, Greer, South Carolina, for Mark. Watch your nice bike video. Great takeaways. Are your presentations only in the corporate world now, or do you do theater shows and other speeches as well? When I grow up, I want to be just like Jeannie Robertson. No, no. I, I, um, most of my present presentations are either to educators, K-12 educators, or to business groups, associations. But Susie has been, you know, has always said, you know what? Jeannie is so incredibly creative. We need to at least give a shot at that. And so we're, we're writing a, a show yeah. called Growing Up St. Cloud which is where I grew up. And it's all about my characters and my hometown. And uh, yeah, I mean, I would, the dream to be would be to do a, my greatest dream right now is to do a one person show like like you do, Jeannie, in some small theaters, only your theaters are big. I, I'll settle for a-, a uh, Jump in because people want clean humor and they want to laugh. And uh, people in the older age bracket have the money to come and buy a ticket and enjoy the show, and they pack the, they pack the houses. If you do those things, it's really funny things they can relate to, get to know, and then they want it clean. Hmm. That, I mean, I hear over and over, "Thank you for keeping it clean." It's not that they haven't heard every bad word in the book, especially if they had teenagers. It's just they don't want to hear it when they come to the shows. And so you, that's what you do. People would pour in. And it's, it's been, I mean, I was scared to do it. I was scared to leave the comfort of speaking at conventions. And then I had somebody talk me into it. And, um, and I love it. I absolutely what? love it more than speaking. Jeannie, what was that very first show like? Well, <laughs> it was scary. The, uh, but speaking, you have to talk to the meeting planner. You have to get the theme the meeting planner would like for you to get over the message. And so many times I'd have to say, that is not what I do. It's just not what I do. But here you walk out on stage and you have control of an hour and a half. And and there you go. And if uh, a group of red hatters come in, you know about the red hatters with the purple and go, if they come in, you can drop a story out and tell a story about red hatters. You're not locked in to, to anything. If a group of Alabama fans come in and they make a point of sitting right on the front in Alabama shirts, it's over for them. <laughs> do you understand? I didn't start it. You started it. But you can do anything you want as long as people are entertained. You would be great to do this. When do you think you'll break this out? Not to push you or anything, but that you sound like my wife Susie. Thank you, Jeannie. I'll work on it. If only you had a, had a, a year of staying at home to work on it, <laughs> <laughs> like we've all had. Hey, you know, all the cabin projects are done. Should, 
I, I did. The, what the cabin, you say? Cabin's fixed. I'll start working on the script right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you need to talk to Al McCree because he's the person that came here and said, I think you can sell tickets. And I said, to whom can I sell tickets? Because we're spoiled in the convention business. We don't sell tickets. We go to the meeting and they bring in the people. Yeah, you have to make one sale in the convention business. You have to make 2000 in the theater. That's right. Patrick, you got your new song out? I do. Patrick sings a song every week. Nepotism is alive and I well. Know. I kill her weeds and sing her song. I, oh. Um, cleat marks cleat in the grass. Mar cleat marks like football players? Yeah. Cleat more or maybe soccer players. Or soccer, soccer players. players. Anybody so I'll give you please. the backstory of the song. And first of all, I'm thrilled that uh, to have written a song. It's been a while, uh, and I've written a couple of songs in the last couple of weeks. But um, it's it's fun. But no one's pushed you on it. It's it's you can't force inspiration. I know. And so, but I just had this idea called cleat marks in the grass, and as Jeannie well knows. And Mark was talking about um, traditions and how important traditions are for kids. And so that's why we have our Sunday night dinner at our house. And we invite our, our friends and family, um, Freebird and Kelly McKinney and their family. And Jeannie comes every week. And we just do a big cookout. But I think in addition to being fun, it's just it's great for the kids to have that kind of experience to look back on. Because hopefully they'll start their own traditions. But anyhow, I was thinking about our house and um, how I'm, I don't work in the yard a lot. I don't get upset when Robert plays soccer or the dog digs because that's what yards are for. And so I wrote this song called Cleat Marks in the Grass. Never had to ask me twice to grab the ball and go outside. A catch is worth its weight in memories. Our house is not a fancy place, but for us it's always been home base. Fertile ground to grow our family. It's the house we live in. It's the home we love in. I wouldn't trade it all away for anything. We got scuff marks on the hardwood and handprints on the walls. Dog hair on the sofa, pencil marks to show how tall. Our home will live forever, though our house it may not last. God bless the scuff marks on the hardwood and cleat marks in the grass. Another summer turns to fall, the pencil marks climb the wall, I still can't get my grass to grow. Guess some things they ain't meant to last, it's all moving too fast, nothing I can do to make it slow. Teaching how to drive a car, hoping they won't drift too far, waiting nervously until they come back home. We got scuff marks on the hardwoods and handprints on the walls. Dog hair on the sofa, pencil mark to show how tall. Our home will live forever, though our house it may not last. God bless the scuff marks on the hardwood and cleat marks in the grass. I'm now a 50-year-old man. The kids no longer hold my hand. Thank God my wife never let it go. I find myself out in the yard, spreading mulch, working hard. Finally got that danged old sod to grow. We're not thinking about moving, but Lord knows if we did, I'd advertise a four-bedroom, three-bath home that's been well-loved in. With scuff marks on the hardwood and handprints on the wall, dog hair on the sofa, pencil marks to show how tall. Our home will live forever, 
though our house may not last. God bless the scuff marks on the hardwoods and cleat marks in the grass. I'll miss the scuff marks on the hardwoods and cleat marks in the grass. Yay! Wow, Patrick, that was amazing. Thank you. He has he has written some of the best songs. The Baptist Choir Chain. Uh, prayer no, chain. It's not prayer chain that your mother's in. It's, 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 a, it's about the true stories, right, Mark? It is. You, you know, that song is so beautiful, Patrick. It reminds me of Harmon Killebrew. Harmon Killebrew played baseball for the Minnesota Twins, hit a lot of home runs. He was our very first Hall of Famer for the Minnesota Twins. And I listened to his speech on WCCO AM radio when he was inducted. And he, quick story, he, he said, I grew up in Idaho on a farm. He said, my brother and I played baseball all the time. And one day we were practicing sliding, stealing second base, and we were just tearing it up. Mom came out of the house and said, boys, you're tearing up the grass. Look at your pants. Stop it now. He said, my dad came out of the barn at that moment and said, mother, we're raising boys, not grass. Let them slide. Oh, I that love that. Wonderful. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. And I know his house. It's all messed up. Yeah, well, <laughs> come on now. It's not all messed up. <laughs> I mean, they got stuff everywhere and two dogs and three children and on and on and they go. So um, they're just having a good time and that's what it's all about. But let me ask you another question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What are your favorite groups or demographics to speak to for inspirational talks? Do you, do you call what you do inspirational talks? Yes. <laughs> okay. To, to inspire is to perhaps take someone's thinking and 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 push it a little bit, to take someone uh, to take some nicer actions in this world. I mean, nice bike is about it's not polishing your own chrome; it's noticing somebody else's, and mm -hmm. so it's about <clears throat> it's about others, not you. And so, if I can move people a little bit to focus a little bit more on others than, than themselves, to share their gifts instead of compare them. Uh, yeah, you would hope to inspire people with your message, to make them feel a little bit better about who they are and what they do every day. So my favorite group, uh, either two, either educators, K-12, I absolutely adore, uh, or anyone in the healthcare profession. I mean, these are, these are two groups that pour out their mind, heart, and soul to help others. And so I like to put a little extra water back in their well so they can help other people a little bit more. Well said. Well said. Okay, what time do you have, Tony? It's about 15 minutes left. All right, we're going to give away three more, and then I pulled out more questions here. So here <laughs> we go, and this is a prize. Yay, a prize to Laura Sims Anderson. Okay, Laura Sims Anderson, wherever you're from. We always say, tell us where y'all live. I might have a story about it but they, they seldom do. And this is one, a big fat piece of paper. K. Squires Herring. Okay. And she says, wouldn't trade for the delightful to mention that Jeannie and her crew part has been shut in. You're stretching me, Carol. K. Okay. Okay, has been shut in place, getting rear-ended a couple of years ago. Oh, this person has had a hard time. I can tell you that if she got rear-ended, she has been sheltering in place and is enjoying the show. Thank you. You've won a prize. Tony, did you get that name? I did. K. Squires Herring. Uh, that is correct. Okay. And then here's another name right here. And that name is Sherry Blaine. And she says, I missed the pop-up. That's on Thursday night because of working overtime. I will be listening tomorrow dark and early while working. She's in California. Well, she is. You know that yes, because I know the name. Won before. But the thing about it is there are a lot of people uh, through this show that we've met that are going through tough times, really tough times, and you feel for them. So anytime I can get them, get them laughing. So – well, how many times would you like to be, because you could pick and choose, and I know this, you may say humbly nice things about me, and I appreciate that, but you're the best. How many times would you 
enjoy speaking, say, a month? You know, it varies so much, Jeannie, as you know. Some months are, are very busy months for conventions, like end of September, October. Uh, December tends to be family time, a little bit slower. So it, anytime I have an opportunity to speak to an audience, I, I feel it's a real honor and privilege. And Naomi Rohde, our dear friend from the National Speakers, uh, uh, is it? Past president of National Speakers. Past president, the, the, priv the privilege to be on the platform. And so, um, I mean, I used to, when I was speaking to schools, I had about 150 performances a year. And now uh, somewhere between, you know, about 75. And uh, every one is, is an opportunity to just get a little bit better. Are you working on any characters right now that you could tell us? My characters are real people and they sit there. I don't have to imitate them, but you like nailed that coach. The minute you opened your eyes big and looked out at us and started talking, we've seen this coach. We know this coach. So anything you're working on that you want to tell, are you keeping that under wraps for, for I, now? I, I had one character I did a while back, back in the millennium, uh, 2000. Um, I had a lot of requests for something about a millennium. So I created, remember Mel Brooks, the 2000 oh, yeah. man? So yes. I, did a, I did a takeoff on Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner's 2000 year old man. <clears throat> and kind of, I don't need makeup for it, but it's kind of a, a an old guy of, Hello, my name is uh, Professor Walter Fields. I'm the world's oldest fella. Uh, this 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 fall, I'll be uh, two uh, an airplane. I've got an airplane. Is this is this? <laughs> uh, I'll be I'll be I'll be two thousand years young. Which you know why? Uh, how did you get to be so old? Uh, I eat uh, you know fiber, good fruits, makes you look gassy. But hey, you know you just keep walking. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so that's that's who I like to be. Uh, one of my other favorite characters is a high school teacher I had, uh, Leroy Radovich. He grew up in northern Minnesota, and Leroy was just very big. He had a big smile on his face, big eyes all the time, and he wore a lot of Old Spice, which to the younger women out there is a very expensive cologne. And you walk, <laughs> you walk by us older guys and say, what's that smell? <laughs> That's Old Spice. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know you, Jeannie, but uh, I'm wearing it right now. There, yeah. <laughs> it's Old Spice yeah. Gavassier. How you doing? <laughs> but Leroy Radovich was, uh, you can always hear him in the hallways going, hey, 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 come over here. Hey, come over here. Hey, hey, how you doing today? Excuse me, Mr. Radovich. Hey, how you doing today? I'm fine. You're fine. Did you, did you think this one through? Hey, ask me how I'm doing. How you doing, Mr. Radovich? I'm doing great. You know why? Because fine's better than the great's better than fine picklehead. That's what it is. <laughs> so, Mark, I've got an idea for a character you need to do because you've talked about you and Sue going to meat raffles. <laughs> now, I had no idea what a meat raffle what? is. What? It's a meat raffle. They actually go into a room and they bid on meat. You oh, got to be. You got to be the auctioneer for the know? meat raffle. Come on. Is yeah, this a I, common thing in Minnesota? I thought it was a national thing until, until I started talking about it from the stage. But for the people out there, I mean, you have people from Germany, V. Gates, Guten Morgen. Um, <laughs> in Minnesota, it's called a meat raffle. This is from the Hoot and Holler Bar up in northern Minnesota, back in Black Duck, you know, way up there. <laughs> Are you putting dollar. us on? No, meat raffle. What happens if you go by the VFW, the American Legion, Hoot and Holler Bar on a weekend, You'll see a sign up front that says meat raffle tonight. What happens is earlier in the day, the bar owner goes to a local grocery store and buys a wheelbarrow full of fresh meat, fresh meat, brings it all back to the bar, puts it all on the pool table. Uh, not because it's refrigerated, but because it's well lit. Uh, food <laughs> safety is not the key issue on this one. And you go to the bar that night and you buy a ticket for a dollar and the bar owner says, okay, everybody get your tickets out round one until all that meat's gone. Here we go. One, zero, two, four. Hey, that's me. And you have the honor of going to the pool table and taking your personal selection of meat. <laughs> kind of a big deal here in Minnesota. That's great. Well, now in the South, we call it roadkill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We auction off and game. Possum. Oh, you get some good possum. You're on a roll. But for our, our, our listeners, <laughs> I don't know. I've I, never heard of that in my life. Well, if 
if you, uh, but the, the, the key point is, because people are saying, are there any rules for meat raffles? Yes, there are. There's two. Number one, you have to buy a ticket. You can't just saunter into a bar, go to the pool table and grab meat and walk out. Hello, costs a dollar. <laughs> and rule number two says right here, you must be present to win. And I, the, the point of the story is, the United States of America is an amazing country because men and women before us bought a ticket. They, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, they sacrifice for us. If you want something in this world, you have to buy a ticket. And rule number two is, you must be present to win. Uh, when what you're a with sneaky others, way. When you're with what others. a sneaky way to keep people in the bar. That's it. <laughs> well, it, it does draw be. a pretty good crowd in Minnesota, Jeannie. So you can... You, you can just be rolling along. This is what Patrick and Tony and I have seen you do at NSA. You're just rolling along and everybody's in hysterics about what you're doing. And then you hit them with a meaning. You hit them with a something. A message. A message. And I, I think you do that better than anybody. Um, well, and I'd like to say something. It's, it's, it's nice to hear just that simple message because all we're inundated with these days is how it's um, politically incorrect to be patriotic. And that's something we need to hear more often that, it, that it, we are enjoying what we enjoy because of the people who came before us. And so keep it going. Well, the, um, the, <laughs> the whole thing is we have a tendency in the South to think upon occasion that we are the funniest. It's our accent. We can put it on and stretch it and do all of that. But can you believe he has done this well being from Minnesota? Uh, <laughs> How embarrassing for us. Oh, it's, it's staggering. The, the high schools, I want everybody, when you have a chance, I've already said, that a lot of kids are not having the years that we had in high school this past year. And I'm sorry for that. But you must Google your name. If you can spell it, you can see it on my Sharon Brock, Sharon Brock. And then watch uh, the best years of your life so far. I got so excited that you put that together. And I was just excited watching it and thinking, this is the way it ought to be. This is the way it's been for a lot of us. And um, every young person that decides it will be that way for them will can have the same experience. Mm. So, oh, there you've, you've done it. The best years of my life so far. And then you punch it and then it plays and y'all are going to be blown away. And if you didn't watch the clip I put up about nice bite, then um, you need to do that too. You'll be fascinated. We've had a good time. What, what time do I have now? We've got can... about seven minutes. Okay, well, I'm going to ask another question, and then I'm going to give away the big prize. Don't budge your jump neck at another. Okay. Lana Parks. Nice bike. He's amazing. Oh. Okay, this is for a prize. Did I say this was for a prize? No, you said you were okay. asking another question. Oh, well, that's not a question, so there you go. And I'll put this one down here, and I'll see what this is. They got carried away on bragging on you and not asking a question. All right. I would love to hear, hear your speech from Las Vegas as well, Jeannie. If I can get a copy, I'll sure put it up. That means I think I did okay. You never know. You never put it up if you don't think you did okay. Looking forward to the – where are the questions? All down in here for Pete's sake. All right. So – That was are they in the green bag? Green uh, are they in the green bag? No, the green bag is just throwing for things. I don't know what we did. Okay, thank you for introducing to. Now this will keep you humble. Are you ready, Mark? Yes, ma'am. I live in Minnesota, and his name is new to me. I've never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what is the most important thing, Mark? And this is from Bonnie Gauderman. What's the most important thing you've learned about life since the birth of your children? What a sweet question, Bonnie. I remember when our first born child, Matt, 
was looking in the mirror about six months old. And I discovered that, you know, for the longest time, kids don't know that that reflection is them. They think it's a plant or a screensaver. But about six months along, God touches us on the shoulder and says, Psst, hey, that's you. And all babies of the world look at mirrors. And when they do, when they realize that that's them, their eyes get big, they smile. And what do they do? They lean forward, touch the mirror, and give their reflection a big kiss. But for a lot of us, when we woke up this morning, walked in the bathroom, looked in the mirror, the last thought in our mind was to lean forward and give the reflection a big kiss. And I think what I realized since our children were born were that children were born in this world accepting of themselves, and they grew from there. And again, we'll go back to an earlier message. Share your talents, don't compare your talents. And you'll see that, that glimmer in that baby's eyes one more time. Oh, wow. He just pulls these things right out of his shirt sleeve. It's amazing. Yeah, it's I've, I've got your website posted there. Some people were asking about how to... Um, how to find you. If they want to connect with us, it's just mark at nicebike.com. Yeah. And do you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but as I understand it, you're still selling nice bike by the good oodles to the next generations. Is that, I don't know what word I was trying to say. I don't have to, I'm Southern. What were you? <laughs> She's saying you're still selling your book, you're right? You're still selling your book, aren't you? We are. We're still selling our book. In fact, we have a second edition coming out uh, September 1st. So, yeah, the book. Well, and it's all short stories, a fun read. Our son illustrated the book. He's an artist, and that helped pay off his car. <laughs> <laughs> so you, this one is uh, the new edition has. I don't know if you heard about it, but when my book came out last year, I had already told all these great people on my porch that it would be here on a certain Saturday and that we were having so many thousands in here for me to sign for them if they wanted it. Well, when the book came, it was messed up. The margins, something was messed up on the margins. We know what caused it and who caused it, but it doesn't matter. They're waiting on the book and they're, you can't sell this book. And without thinking, I said on the show one day, I am so sorry. Uh, we'll have them in three weeks, but we cannot sell this to you. This thing is not up to my par. I said, the only person that would want this is somebody that collects first edition, first edition prints. And Tony, in a few minutes, was waving her arms from back there. I said, don't mention first edition again. The orders are flowing in. And I had a I had a speaker say, Jeannie, you're just a genius at marketing. And I said, no, I just keep talking. I just keep talking, and that gets you in trouble. All right, let's see what this one is. Shirley, where are your questions? What, what motives you to speak to a high school audience? Well, you thought they would laugh. You and that group you were with thought they would yeah, laugh. Yeah, what, what motivated me to speak to high school audiences, I – my father, uh, uh, one great piece of advice he gave me was, uh, Mark, you, you're going to have a job the rest of your life. You can only be a kid once. And so get involved in school as much as you possibly can. You don't need to buy anything, but you need to invest in memories. So I took my father's advice, and I was involved in everything in high school, same as Eugenie, same as Patrick and Tony. And I love my high school experience. Sure, there's some tough moments, but you get a lot more out of something when you throw yourself into it. And so my advice, it's like going to see a, a great movie and telling your friends about it. Oh, you should go see this movie or a restaurant. Oh, you should go to this restaurant. I loved it. For me, it was the same thing. I love my high school years. Here's how you can make the most of it. And so that's what motivated me to, to encourage students to make memories, not regrets. And for some reason, people look at speakers and think, I just couldn't do that. I just couldn't do that. Thank I can't God. believe he could do it, huh? I'm glad they feel that way. I'm glad Patrick's glad we have work. I watch my I plumber. Enjoy and I having I, you. Yeah, I watch. I watch my plumber, and I go, "I boy, I I couldn't do that. That's pretty good." Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, your plumber. That's very good. This has been great. I'm almost envious of you sitting out there by these lakes in Minnesota, and. Um, 
You going to bring Sue in and let us tell her thank you too? Because hadn't she been sitting there? She she's is. Already, she's she right. Already said she's so good looking and pretty and all of that. Oh boy! Here's the love. Expected this. Here's the love of my life. That's the Sue we know, and we see y'all both. At you're going to the national speakers next year, hopefully. We sure are. We'll be there. That would be next year in Nashville. It'd be a little bit cooler than Las Vegas. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we I don't wish think we my grandparents were as cool as these guys are. Oh, <laughs> we, we, wish, we wish you were in the chair next to you right now, Jenny. Yeah, but certainly. some another other time, time. we'll Carolina. do it another time. Thank y'all so much, and keep them laughing and thinking. Oh, Just as you. important to keep yeah, them thinking. Hey, Sue. No, I'm coming. We're coming for a vacation. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I let me see. I think I'm up that way soon, and I could hang around two or three days at that water. Oh, sure. we are kidding you don't get scared thanks everybody for tuning in and we uh, will see you wait, next Saturday. wait 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 you wait. have not given your audio oh, book away I'm, i have messed up okay this is we patrick and i taped this in a closet upstairs we took beaver's bedroom when he left left home and we made his bedroom into my personal closet then we realized that was the best place to audio this audio book this is seven hours and about 25 minutes it's seven cds and if you don't want to listen to it on a long trip or anything like that then take it somewhere where people don't have the flexibility to go different places and let them spread those seven cds around for a while um, i don't like the terms but senior living places i guess I don't know. Either way, I'm gonna. This is the winner right here. Going down in here and pull out a name, and the winner of this week's seven hour and twenty six minutes is from Decatur, Alabama. Nelda Kimbro Seegers, S E G A R S, from Decatur, Alabama. Tony. All right. We she we need to get an interpreter for the whole show for Nell Nelda to learn because we're from Alabama and we know it's hard to understand sometimes. <laughs> Bye y'all. Keep laughing. Thanks for everything y'all do for people. She's a heck of a lot of fun, Jeannie Robertson. Oh, she's a heck of a lot of fun, Jeannie Robertson.